Hello everyone, welcome back to the MTG Goldfish Podcast, episode 124, your weekly podcast covering everything Magic the Gathering related. You can find us on Google Play, iTunes, mtggoldfish.com, and on YouTube. Joining us as always, the crew, the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How are you, Richard? Hey guys, what's going on? It's going well. Seth, probably better known as Saffron Oliver, resident jank brewer and all-around content creator. Seth, how's it going? Uh, going good, guys. How are you? It's going well. And Chaz, as always, uh, all-around content creator focusing on the financial aspect of the game. Uh, for this week, we got uh, an early <laughs> an early look into Hour of Devastation, uh, probably not intentional. So we got a few cards to talk about for Hour of Devastation. Arch Enemy, also, we got to... we. The, the deck lists were revealed. We got to see some interesting reprints, uh, new art and promos for the new Planeswalkers. So we'll talk about that as well. And we'll just kind of look into Arch Enemy. Uh, it's been a while since uh, this <laughs> supplemental product has actually been around. Uh, last last time it was it was quite some time ago. And then we'll wrap it up with some fish mail. So uh, pretty easy docket for this week. And let's just jump into Hour of Devastation. Uh, well, first of all, I guess. What did you think about like just just seeing this and and getting it uh, this early? I mean, it is kind of ra- right around the corner, so it's not that far ahead. But um, this was uh, a little concerning. But uh, at least it was from an official source, quote unquote. Well, I mean, Richard, we, we didn't they didn't give it to us. Right? They right. they accidentally <laughs> posted. I think it was like a like a game day thing or standard showdown or something, but. There was an article, and the background, instead of showing the existing cards, they actually showed three chase cards from the new set. You know, people found it, it was posted everywhere, and then a couple hours later, it was pulled down by Wizards. So, these cards came from the Wizards website. We don't know if they're real, they're probably real, they're available for pre-order and stuff, but it's possible that, you know, they, they had an old version on, but... They did come from Wizards. You can actually pre-order these cards from SEG and other places. So uh, they're probably real. They're probably like 99% real, but uh, unintentional. So Wizards pulled them down. I believe this was not the way they wanted to spoil this, but we got our hands on them anyway. So let's talk about the new cards. Chase card of the set. No more surprises. No big reveal. Nicol Bolas, God Pharaoh, Planeswalker. Four blue, black, and a red. So seven converted mana costs. Planeswalker, Bolas, 7 loyalty, 4 abilities, so Chaz the Prophet was correct, plus 2 target opponent exiles cards from the top of his or her library until he or she exiles a non-land card. Until end of turn, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Plus 1, each opponent exiles 2 cards from his or her hand. Minus 4, Nicol Bolas, God Pharaoh deals 7 damage to target opponent or creature and opponent controls. Minus 12, exile each non-land permanent your opponent's control. Yeah, I guess they fully went, they, they listened, went back, listened to the podcast, and they were like, <laughs> we're not going to mess around. Seth wants to Nicole Boas, and here we go. <laughs> no more surprises. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was one off. I, 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 I mean, Marvel, okay, Aetherworks Marvel aside, uh, I thought it would be six, but four abilities, I think it obviously should have been, just needs to be seven because... Uh, of the abilities, but uh, this is pretty powerful. Now, Grixis is a real cost. I don't know the future of Aetherworks Marvel, um, although uh, you and I had a discussion on Twitter about this, uh, Seth, about the future of the uh, Marvel, that it might kind of stay or stick around for a little bit longer. But yeah, this is going to be another powerful interaction, um, and this does stick around for quite some time, even after Ulamog rotates. And if Marvel is still around, this will likely be the top end. Although you're going to have to kind of switch your colors. And I don't know how Grixis will end up, you know, playing out. But this is certainly a huge Marvel target. And it does, like, crazy stuff. I'm probably in the minority here. But I actually don't think Nicole Bolas is that crazy with Marvel. Like, it's crazy in the way that any 6, 7, 8, 9 mana card is crazy with Marvel. Like, you're getting something for half of its intended mana cost. So, it's in that sense, it's crazy. But I really think that it's worse than Ulamog, almost certainly. And probably just worse than Chandra as well, if you're playing a Marvel deck. Like, I think it's it's like the third target. So, I think, for me, this is more something that I would see post-rotation with Marvel. But I don't expect it to unseat the two big Marvel targets right now. 
Yeah, I agree. Because you know, Ulamog is just better, I think. And Chandra stabilizes the board. Whereas Bolas has his minus four, but that's just one creature. Which, you know, standard is kind of swarmy right now. So yeah, it's not going to upseat those two in standard, but Ulamog will rotate. And slapping this thing down on turn four and just removing two cards from your opponent's hand is actually pretty brutal as a plus one. Uh, ultimate leaves a little to be desired. Ultimate doesn't actually win the game. If you have Nickel Bolas going for a while, uh, your opponent probably doesn't have a non-land permanent in play. <laughs> so the ultimate seems a bit weird, but just playing cards for free, emptying their hand of counter spells or anything they could have, and just doming them for seven, right? Because you, you can actually just plus bolus and minus minus, and that's 14 damage. Bolus can kill someone pretty quick without an ultimate. So I think after Ulamog rotates, uh, you'll see Nickel Bolus in Marvel decks, yep. if Marvel is still around. And just as a control finisher, pretty good. Like right now, the control colors are blue and red. Black is always a solid control color, you know, so Grixis is a thing. I think our mana can support him. Uh, whether you'd play Bolus or whether you can actually play a Bolus as opposed to Sphinx of the Final Word or something like that as your finisher against other control decks is questionable, or maybe just Gear Hulks are good enough. But I could see you trying Nicol Bolus as a top end in a control deck. It reminds me a lot of Karn is probably yep. the most similar Planeswalker I can think of. Like, you can attack your opponent's hand, much like Karn. You can deal with, I guess in this case, it's a Planeswalker or creature. You can't nuke lands with the negative, but it still it makes up for that by being able to actually kill your opponent, which Karn doesn't directly do. Like, it kind of does by just destroying all your opponent's resources, but this more directly can just kill your opponent. And then the ultimate kind of resets the game. It's not as strong as Karn's ultimate, but if you plus one, plus one, get your opponent empty-handed, then exile everything but their lands, you're probably going to win that game, even though it doesn't win in the way that other Planeswalkers do. So I think it's very good. It is important to remember that traditionally in Standard, Karns, Ugins are very good, but they're very archetype specific. And they, that, mm -hmm. the mana cost of them sort of keeps them in check naturally, just cause seven mana is so much. And I think right now, I think that Marvel is actually the reason I don't think Nicole Bolas will see a lot of play Im immediately, because if you're fighting a format where people are casting Ulamogs on turn four, like, what are the odds you can get to a seven mana planeswalker? And even if you get to seven mana, what are the odds you can tap out for it and not just die to an Ugin when your opponent, while you're tapped out on the next turn? I don't think this is, well, the good thing is Chandra actually plays very well into Nicole Boas. So that's actually, you know, without Marvel, you can still kind of ramp up into Nicole Boas pretty easily with Chandra. So I like the interaction there. I kind of disagree. Like, yeah, Ulamog is very good. I don't think it dethrones Ulamog as, like, the prime Marvel target while Ulamog is still in standard. But I do think it's better than Chandra. I mean, it can do basically whatever Chandra can do and more. You're talking about big Chandra, right? Oh, oh, Flamecaller? Yeah, board rest oh, Chandra. I, oh, okay, okay. Well, I was, I was talking about the interaction with Tortured Defiance. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the four mana one with four... Yeah, well, Torsha Defiance is a four mana planeswalker. She do, and right, Chandra. You Flame Caller is a six mana, and mostly Marvel decks use her as a sweeper. So you know, because you're behind, because you played a tune with Ether and random stuff that doesn't do anything. When Chandra comes down, it sweeps the board and stabilizes you. Whereas, you know, Bolus isn't going to help you if there's twelve zombies on the battlefield. Right, right. Okay, so that getting that out of the way. Um, yeah, the ultimate. <sighs> Kind of, yeah, I guess it's, it's okay. Like, a little bit more to be desired, but that is its only, you know, this, this card's only option to kind of deal with, uh, flooding the board. I kind of wish, like, it had something in its other abilities that, that did that, but I guess dealing seven damage kind of deals with a lot of other things. Just off on a tangent, though, I can't believe they, they messed up the dark intimations, like, <laughs> interaction here. That has to be, Where's your book, Richard? Get your book. Put this down. <laughs> Worst flavor fail. Okay, I get wait, that why, maybe... Wait, wait, Why is it a flavor fail? Okay, because, because. I get that one Dark Intimations. Okay, that's one thing. It, it doesn't work. You're telling me, if I have four Dark Intimations in my <laughs> graveyard, I still can't ultimate Nicole Boas. That has to be 
the worst failure I've seen in recent history. That's a Come on. that's a development fail or something. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I mean, you what, you call it what you want. Development nothing. story. It's a story card. Like how? Like four of them in your graveyard? I still can't ultimate. All right. So that's aside. Um, yeah, I think it's it's very good. Uh, I don't know how viable it would be without Marvel, though. Um, again, uh, maybe the Chandra Torture Defiance. You know, you kind of get this Grixis. And you can kind of ramp into Nicole Bolas. You could do it that way. I'm kind of looking at it just from, like, Marvel. Because you're right, Seth. Seven, eight mana walkers. I mean, other than, like, Ugin had some success. Even Garuk, uh, the Apex Predator, kind of saw a little bit of success. And Karn saw a little bit of success. So it's very build around. But maybe uh, it's it's a little bit in a better place. Because uh, you do have some other tools in, in these uh, colors too rampant in Nicole Boas and the most unlikeliest is the the red card. So uh yeah, I'm I'm interested to see the the future of this card. It also has the downside that it doesn't naturally go in green decks. I think most of the right. play we saw from all those planeswalkers you mentioned were mostly in base green decks because you can ramp so easily into it. And while it is nice that four mana Chandra does give you some ramp, blue, black, and red aren't really the ramp colors i guess we do have like hedron archives and some colorless ramp like that but for the most part i think that's a additional challenge compared to a car or an ugin where you can just jam it in the best ramp deck possible this is a little more challenging to make work in a ramp deck i did want to ask you before we move on uh does the plus two bother you at all i know we've been talking about randomness lately mostly because oh, I, I keep actually, bringing it up but <laughs> i was it, actually gonna bring that up yeah that drives that that's the it one thing the plus I, two. it's too random it really, I really dislike it. It's, it's so high variant. I know, like, we already have a high variant standard, and there's going to be games where people play Nicole Volas and just get an Ugin, or an Ulamog, rather, and just win the game on the spot, like, on the ultimate coin flip. It's like a 5 percenter, but they hit it. So that, the randomness of it kind of drives me crazy. I wish it just, I don't even know, exiled the top card or something. The reverse <laughs> cascade thing that you get to cast for free is just so good. Wait, getting the top card is even worse, right? That's even more random. You basically want, like, look at the top six and choose one if you want to get less random. But <laughs> yeah. then you just marveled, right? It's like the reverse marvel, right? Yeah. So you really want like Jace Architects of Thought <laughs> Ultimate, where you just look at their deck and play something, which is I really too hope we see it two. at least one time on camera. So we go Super Variance Hearthstone mode just to annoy you, Seth. Where yeah. we spin the Marvel, <laughs> get Nicole Boas, and then you spin Nicole Boas and get their Ulamog. Oh my god! And goodness. we just we were what, just what would actually happen is you get a puzzle knot and then die. <laughs> oh, yeah. They would. You're so. It's sometimes you're gonna get the Uamog, but most of the times you're gonna get a a yeah the puzzle knot or. I don't mind this effect. It just means you don't play Nickel Bolas in a deck that plays you know one drops or against a deck that plays one drops. You don't want to be plusing, and if if you plus two. You are resigning yourself to the fact that you might get a 1-1 one, one that does nothing. But you might win the game. With what, it, though? It, <laughs> like, I mean, I guess if you hit their Gideon, or you might hit their Toolcraft Exemplar. <laughs> but you should know that right? you could minus 4, you can plus 1. You have other options with this card, so I think... I, I don't mind it as much. You You have options to control the randomness. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. I don't know. It just seems, I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen to me, and I'm going to be on my <laughs> hypergeometric calculator figuring out what the chances are that my opponent hit my Ugin and killed me, and it's yeah. going to be like 2%, and then I'm going to be all sad. Yeah, but I really like Bolus, though. It's it All the abilities are quite unique. Yeah. Right? We haven't seen these abilities on Planeswalkers before, and I actually really like the minus four. I think the mini ultimate is pretty cool. Like, two minus fours is 14 life. That's that's probably someone's probably dead. So you don't actually get to the real ultimate. The real ultimate is the only thing that's lacking, so I guess you don't want a doubling season into Bolas. But even then, that's still... Exiling everything else is pretty good anyway. So if you're cheating Bolas into play, that, that probably is a good deal. So I actually like Nick Bolas. While I also wish Dark Intimations was more impactful, it does let you negative twice in a row and just 14 your opponent so like it does do some stuff but i was hoping the numbers Mm. lined up a little bit better too but it's not completely useless Uh, i still don't think it's good enough to make you play a card as bad as dark intimations in a deck because that card's 
pretty bad. Do you get the planeswalker back from your graveyard? What do you get back from your graveyard? A creature, I think. Do you actually get something back? For what, dark intimations? Dark intimations. I know they, they sack a creature and discard. You draw... You return a creature or planeswalker from your graveyard to your hand. Then oh, so that's card. actually... I mean, that's not terrible. Yeah. I never thought it was a terrible card. I mean, it's, it's five mana, bad. though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can just keep uh, getting back here, Nicole. I, like, I just, I, I like, I like Volus. I think we'll, I think Volus will see play in a ramp because uh, you have oath, you have oath of oath of Nissa. So maybe someone will try yeah, you oath do. of Nissa to use green ramp and get a Volus <laughs> out there. You could do that. Yeah. So wait, so Richard, overall, does this fit the bill of you know the character in the in the story, the God Pharaoh? Like, does he? Does Nicole Bolas? Is this like the big villain we've all been waiting for? Uh, I don't know. He seems scarier in his previous incarnations. <laughs> <laughs> Here, his like plus two is RNG ish. You know, summoning a one one toolcraft exemplar may not be that scary. <laughs> Exiling zero cards from your hand because your hell bent may not be that scary. <laughs> Dealing seven damage. Eh. I kind of like the old one where you yep. just straight up destroy. <laughs> you know, destroy a permanent, right? So scarier but you know i don't want them to print those vanilla basically omnixilis but with four abilities so sure. I, I think given the history of bolus cards i think this is a really good card but you know he could be a lot scarier he could be destroying two creatures at once or wrapping the board or something right yeah all right so from a very scary planeswalker <laughs> to one that's in the running for worst planeswalker ever we have samit the tested so samit has had her spark ignited Two red and a green Planeswalker Samit, four starting loyalty, plus one, up to one target creature gains double strike until end of turn, minus two, Samit the Tested deals two damage, divided as you choose among one or two target creatures and players, and or players, minus seven, search your library for up to two creatures and or Planeswalker cards, put them onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. This ah. card is so bad. Oh, it's it's amazingly bad. Like, I really think it's the worst Planeswalker since Tip All. Why they gotta do this to the green red Planeswalkers? I mean, oh, honestly. Oh, green has so many good cards. I don't know. No, 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 no. I just meant they went <laughs> Arlen Cord, same, same casting cost to this. Like, why they gotta do that? I mean, they, they made some, they know the formula. Like, they know they can make some good green-red walkers. They had Sarkhan Vol. They had Domri Raid. Now you, you go to Arlen, which, you know, I guess it got a bad rap, but it wasn't, like, completely terrible. Then you go to this, like, come on. Yeah. I mean, four mana for a fork bolt? Like, that. that is not... <laughs> What's with the plus just... one? Since when is gaining double strike worth anything? It's not. I mean, just, I honestly, like, you could have literally just taken Arlen Cord's text and just superimposed it right over to the plus one, and that would have been better. It's actually better. Especially in a, in a set with, with, uh, Exert. I don't know how you missed that. It should be maybe Double Strike and Vigilance or something like that. Give me something. So we went from, like, the, the kind of builder, this, this creature, in, when Samut was a creature, all about, you know, Exerting and Flash, and it's like, all, all these keywords on this card, to what? I just don't understand. Is this just a walking, like, minus seven? Her, her spark ignited, and she's phoning it in. She's not really putting in the effort anymore. She's like, I made it. Planeswalker, face card of a set. <laughs> like, I, I don't understand these abilities. Like, none of them are worth anywhere close to four mana. Like, give a creature double strike? A forked bolt? Like, could you not give us lightning bolt at least? <laughs> right? Like, I, or I arc lightning? I don't know why you would play this, and I think... Her only way of being viable is the old Tybalt strategy, where you hope everyone disrespects you so much that they just ignore you, and you might sneak your way into the ultimate, which is the only legitimate use of Semlet uh, in a uh, doubling season deck or something. So you kind of just gotta hope they just disrespect you, ignore you, let you plus plus, and then you somehow wrath their board, get the final plus, and then ultimate. It's it's kind of good with Tibalt, because you can always hope you randomly discard your Samus for a better card. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I played Narset I played Narset in Modern last week, and the best use of Narset was confusing opponents. When they thought sees me, they take the Narset instead of the Liliana because they're all confused. <laughs> Like, that's what someone is, right? Like, the, you, they're like, oh my god, you're playing her. You must have some crazy synergy. Let me, you know, let, let me get rid of that. Like, like, they think you're playing doubling season, so they thought you. Samut out, you know, like. 
I didn't have anything going. Just the decoy. <laughs> the decoy planeswalker. We don't know anything else in an hour. Could there be... I mean, we have Oath of Gideon still in standard. Maybe there's, like, something uh, akin to, like, Anointed Procession or something like that that just deals with planeswalkers. Maybe there's, like, a way... Another card that enables Samut to have ultimate. Ah, so we're doing this the Healy Rai move where we print a useless planeswalker and then print a two card hey. combo, making it utterly uh, busted. Hey. <laughs> hey, I'm just throwing it out there, you know? I'm just trying to look past the badness, you know, in a vacuum and trying to see maybe there's something else that makes this better. What what could that card be? Uh, uh, an enchantment that said, if you control a creature with double strike, you win the game? Like, I, no, I no, no, can't no. even envision no, a card like, that would make sense. No, 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 like a, du- like a doubling season. season. No, but a doubling season maybe is four mana, but it only affects Planeswalkers or something like that. Jeez, I, I can't imagine that they would print that. Uh, I think it's why too not? good. Why not? They have they have Anointed Procession. That's a really good card for four mana for tokens. They had Doubling Season at five, which was everything. And they have like Deep Glow Skate and something like that. I think a four mana only Planeswalkers could happen. It's not like uh, totally you're out gonna there. Have to not build in your standard. Own. I, I see Oath of Gideon, Summit the Tested in your future, Seth. <laughs> just, just get three Oath of Gideons down. They needed a Dark Intimations for some moot. So <laughs> all four of them in your graveyard, you get the ultimate. <laughs> I will say that she is, as bad as she is in almost every possible situation, she is sneakily maybe the best Planeswalker or one of the best Planeswalkers for doubling season, Yeah, which is super fringe, but that does mean she'll probably see modern play in the Double Moon Planeswalker deck. She'll probably see a lot of Commander play in decks that are built around doubling season. So even though she's horrible, that one synergy will mean that she has some yeah. amount of demand and sees some amount of play. Yeah, I mean, you you wrote it best. You don't normally gauge a Planeswalker on the ultimate. But in this case, I mean, it is fringe, and it's exactly like you said. But with doubling season, with something that gives Samud enough loyalty to ultimate right away, I mean, that's straight up tooth and nail, additionally for Planeswalkers. And that's just really, I mean, that's obviously a, a powerful effect that we've seen in the past that can just flat out win games. Yeah. I think I mentioned this precast, and but I think really that this was added late in development. If you mm. remember a couple months ago, uh, Marrow wrote an article or a blog post or something saying, yeah, basically, right. we heard you about the Gatewatch Planeswalker. So starting an hour, we're going to have new characters. And this almost feels to me like this was going to be Nissa 5 or whatever we have in standard right now. But then they were like, eh, they don't want more Gatewatch. So at the very last minute, they're like, we got to make a Planeswalker that's not Gatewatch. And we're just going to make sure that we err on the side of it not being broken because we've seen jace and some of the crazy planeswalkers that could be too good so that's what it feels like to me now yeah and they said that starting an hour right like yeah. that's hour going forward including hour because yeah. i remember there was like that whole post you're, you're right i mean it could very well be maybe we we saw last minute changes in development maybe there's like an oath of samut uh, who knows maybe there's like a new because they did say additionally to the to the gatewatch stuff that there is going to be storyline implications that are going to change the course of the story, you know, going forward after, you know, in hour and forward. Maybe there's like a new gate watch or there's just a new, you know, a semblance of planeswalkers that are not the gate watch anymore because all the gate watch dies or something like that. Who knows? Um, so maybe who knows? Or maybe Sam, it's just like the token planeswalker that Nicole Bola skills. <laughs> that's, maybe <laughs> that's why she's so bad just so she can come in this one set get killed by nicole bolas move move on with the gate watch very much go, magic players <laughs> maybe yeah there's just a cannon fodder yep all right <laughs> last last leak bantu's last reckoning one black black sorcery destroy all creatures lands you control don't untap during your next untap step three mana unconditional wrath where you get exhaustion. Uh, yeah, there's uh, definitely a condition. <laughs> I love this card, not because I think it's insane, but because it's such an amazing card to talk about and debate. Yeah. Like, I've, I can't remember a card in recent memory that had more split opinions on it. Some people yeah. think it's absurd. Other people think it's completely unplayable. So what do you guys think? What camp do you fall into <sighs> with this card? I'm somewhere like in the middle, but leaning towards... Uh, 
not as good as people think. But that doesn't mean it's bad. I, I just think we've seen a like similar effects that have never saw the light of day. I mean, when I looked at, um, you know, just to draw a parallel, you know, we saw what is that? The savor the moment, which was you know kind of the same thing. It's a it's a take an extra turn card that never sees any play in the take the extra turn card decks. I mean, but it's a three mana take the extra turn card because the 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 downside is. You know, it's just it's just too much to overcome. I mean, it never even really saw play in like Super Friends decks. Never really saw play anywhere. Bantu's Last Reckoning, love the art, love the card. I think it has a place somewhere, but really in, in standard. Now, just looking at standard, what does this deal with that like Sweltering Suns can't deal with? You know, on turn three. Now, beyond turn three, I think it gets a little bit better. Where you know the lands, maybe it's it's less of a downside because you're just clearing the board. Um, it's less likely, you know, you have a little bit more control over the game. It's less likely that they can kind of just repopulate the board as quickly. Um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of different variables going on. I just think the lands you control don't untap is, is a pretty big drawback. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you think, Richard? Unplayable. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing, you know, I'm not 100% confident in that. It's possible that this is usable, but basically... If you play this as a turn three or turn four sweeper, you're probably going to lose the game. Like, skipping an entire turn is not worth sweeping one turn earlier. Like, I'd rather turn five Fumigate than turn four Bantu's Reckoning and take the entire turn off. And Fumigate actually has upside of gaining life. So I don't think you would ever do this early. And, like, on turn three, do you desperately need to wrath the board, right? Probably a lightning strike or something would suffice. Uh, you know, sweltering suns will two for one. You know, you're not going to like four for one someone because it's only turn three, like they haven't done anything. So it's not worth taking the turn off. And then late game, this is basically a wrath that takes like, you know, all of your mana, six mana, seven mana, whatever, because even the lands you're not using to uh, use to cast the spell, you can't tap them because they're not going to untap. So the fact that it costs three mana is irrelevant at this point. You know, I guess you could you know, Bantu's Less Reckoning, and then play Gear Hulk or something, and then, you know, just take the entire next turn off. But at that point, I'd just play, you know, your 5-mana Wrath again. So I don't think there's actually any point to this. And, you know, sometimes you'll use it and it'll it'll save you. Like, maybe you turn 4 Wrath, you 3 for 1 them, and they have no follow-up, and you you dodged it. I, I don't think that would be very common. Like, most of the time... You know, they, they still have other stuff to do. They'll play another creature, crew up their Heart of Kiran, hit you, you know, whatever. I, I think it's akin to, like, pathing your own creature as a ramp spell. You know, sometimes you're going to do it and it's going to help you, but most of the time you're doing it, you're not happy, and you're, you know, this is not what you set out to do. You know, I don't think you're going to turn three, turn four Wrath and not untap all of your lands and be happy about it. I think your opponent yeah. will rebuild, slam their Gideon, make some tokens or whatever, and I don't think you, you really want to be doing this. So I don't think it's going to be played in standard uh, unless, I don't know, there's a Snapcaster or something. And for some reason, you can Snapcaster Bantu's Reckoning for five. And <laughs> that might be worth the downside. But I, I don't see that one mana being worth the extra turn or two mana in standard. Now, this gets better if there's more creatures that do something when they die. I mean, we have the kind of pseudo doom traveler where you get the two, two. I like that. This actually is pretty good synergy with Bantu herself. So I kind of like that interaction. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of deck building decisions that need to <laughs> happen for this to, you know, be good. So pro- the problem is, is it, is it, is it worth it? Like, yeah. w- again, what does this do that sweltering suns or like anger the gods, even in modern, does like Jund even like wouldn't play this in modern? Like, I, yeah, you wipe all fish. I mean, and you don't have to worry about them being, you know, pumped up by lords. But mostly, anger the gods does, you know, does the job. You, you definitely wouldn't and, play this in modern because yeah, you can pay one more mana and get to damnation. Pretty much, and taking a turn off will probably kill you in modern, like outright. <laughs> but in standard, <laughs> we're talking two mana, right, from three to five. And, like, is that worth it? I don't think so. But the the one point that makes it worth it is if you're playing Mana Rocks. Hmm. If you're playing a Winter Orb deck, then Bantu's Last Reckoning is pretty good, but I don't think there are Winter (laughs) Orb decks or Mana Rocks in Standard to make this viable. But, you know, the fact that you have Artifact Mana, 
uh, you don't you know you don't need to untap your lands because you untap your artifact mana and you're good to go. So if, if there is a lot of mana rocks in Hour of Devastation, then this could actually be pretty good. Also, Planeswalkers, yeah. and you know what could be interesting is if Marvel does uh, this is again assuming Marvel doesn't get banned or anything like that. I mean. You're kind of making a case. I mean, you have Bantu's Last Reckoning. You're going to have some some crazy stuff out with Marvel. You don't really care if your lands don't untap. You just have a clean sweep of the board. You don't have to worry about anything, you know, coming back or or not, three damage not destroying anything. Um, so who knows? I mean, you don't really need your lands once Marvel is spinning. And if you nail, like, a Planeswalker like Nicole Bolas or something like that, I mean, do you really need your lands anymore? Well, I mean, if you're spinning Marvel, you're probably winning. What about all right. those other games where you don't have a Marvel and you actually do need to sweep the board? <laughs> yeah, so there, it's it's like okay when it's good, I guess, in good scenarios, but like really bad when it's bad. Yeah, I think the the ceiling is probably maybe a sideboard card in standard mm. in the best case, and it's still super hard to really envision scenarios where where this is the best card for the situation. Like you said, the big problem is like anger of the gods, sweltering suns, those type of effects. There's very few creatures that you miss with those that you have to kill with Bantu's reckoning, but you also can't wait an extra turn or two to use a real wrath that doesn't time walk you. So I think this card is super flashy. When you read three mana wrath, it sounds insane, but I think it's actually close to unplayable i wouldn't say quite unplayable but i think it's pretty close what would they have to print to make this worth it more more creatures that either do something when they die or yeah like very efficient mana rocks like you said richard indestructible mana dorks (laughs) something like that i mean i can envision a format where it's good like if imagine if everyone has uh i don't know turn two Grim Flayers into turn three Loxodon Smiters. Stuff like that that you can't actually sweltering suns away. Your opponent's right. emptying their hand really quickly. And in that scenario, Bantu's Last Reckoning actually might be the exact card that you need. It's just hard to envision a format lining up like that. Are you happy if you two for one and then exhausting yourself? Or does no. it need to be more? So obviously one for one, exhausting yourself is like terrible, right? No, terrible. I think... Definitely two plus. Or do you need three or do you need four? I think the lowest is two. I mean, I don't even think that. So picture your opponent plays a two drop. Okay. Your opponent plays a three drop. Are you really happy happy if you bond two's last reckoning away a two drop and a three drop and you have to skip your fourth turn? If it was like, you know, a smiter or, a lot, or an anafenza and something else like a grim flare, then definitely, yeah. But I just if it's like toolcraft exemplar and like motorist then no but the problem is if they're playing those cards in their deck they're probably playing them more of those cards on the turn you're taking off right like imagine yeah. they grim flayer into anafenza you bantu's last reckoning the next turn they just double grim flayer right but let's just say they do that you have sweltering suns you just automatically die the thing that is, is like, it so doesn't... you had no chance as opposed to some sort or, of chance. But you could just have, you know, two fatal pushes in your hand. And, you know, instead of playing Bantu's Last Reckoning, yeah. play, you know, <laughs> just spot removal. <laughs> take, take you know, take the Grim Flayer hit, use spot removal and offense, uh, two turns later, wrath the board. <laughs> right? Like with, with an actual five mana wrath. The other thing beyond Bantu's Last Reckoning and standard is wraths in general just aren't that good. Vehicles... Planeswalkers yep. like Gideon, Indestructible, Ulamogs, uh, Etherworks Marvels. Like, the format, if this was literal damnation, I don't think it would be insanely good in standard right now. Just and, because and, the format is very resilient to wrath effects. You're right. And, and again, for those that saying they printed a better damnation, just let me stop you there. Okay, don't. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, okay? First of all... So obviously it's not better than Damnation, but here, here's a point for the pro Bantu's Last Reckoning case. We have Fatal Push in the format, and you're not actually time-walking yourself because you can Bantu's Last Reckoning, sweep their board, they play a creature, your turn, you play a land, which comes into play untapped, yeah. and then you Fatal Push whatever, and yep. then you're on your merry way. So that that, that is a, a scenario where the downside... You can mitigate the downside because we do have efficient one mana removal in the format. 
I think for this to have really been like insanely good, this needed maybe be destroy all creatures and artifacts or something like that. Like this, the sweepers these days have to get rid of non creatures as well because there's just so many of them lying around, and they're going to be in standard for quite some time. Yeah, I like I like the added effect. I like artifacts or even planeswalkers. Uh, what about if it was instant speed? Would it, it be was too instant good? speed. I, I think I like this a little bit better. Like it's not even clear to me that it'd be too good at instant speed, right? But then I think it right. makes a real challenge because it it offers you something more than damnation or fumigate. Whereas yes. the other ones are, you know, would you take off? Would you basically Simeon Spirit Guide and then exhaustion yourself? Is basically the question today, and most of the time I'm going to say no. But would you quicken and Simeon Spirit Guide, then exhaust yourself? Then I'm like, you can hit a lot more stuff, and it becomes a lot more versatile at that point. I think it would be broken at instant speed, or too good. I don't know about broken. That might be too uh, too much to go that uh, go that far and say broken. But I think it would be too good because you just wait till your opponent's end step, clear their board, you skip your next you're turn, still your opponent's walked. board's empty. They don't get to they don't get to attack you though. That's a big thing with Bantu's Reckoning. You cast it. You're, you sweep your opponent's board. They follow up with two two drops or a four drop. You don't untap, so they're guaranteed to hit you with those creatures, essentially, discounting the fatal push. So you're not even really saving damage. You're just kind of mm. pushing it forward a turn. I mean, in some scenarios, if your opponent's empty-handed or something, but if your opponent just follows up with more creatures, you're tapped out. They get to attack with those before you even untap. If you can do it at instant speed, you avoid that whole problem. Just destroying all creatures, I think if it was instant, it, you're still only destroying the creatures. If this was destroy all creatures and artifacts, this definitely would still need to be a sorcery. But I like that a little bit better because then you still exhaust yourself, but you're dealing with the problematic cards that sweepers – or the, you're dealing with the problem that all sweepers have right now. If it was instant, I think it would be modern staple. I don't know about staple. I think it would be that <laughs> I, th- I think it, I think it would be used. I think it would be good because, I mean, we have stuff like Kozlex Return. Yeah, I mean, you almost have that right now. For an extra mana, you basically have, like, Cryptic Command, so... Wait, what? How is this Cryptic Command? <laughs> no, I said you almost... At instant, it's not, like, a hard modern staple. For one more mana, you have cards like Cryptic Command. Uh, I think it would be pretty good. I, I think I think you could make an argument for it being used in modern, but I don't know that staple would be... You know, is Damnation a staple in modern? Uh, yeah, it's, like, I guess barely even fair. played, right? right. <laughs> but... Yeah, if, if Damnation isn't a staple, then I guess yeah. this would I mean, be. Modern... I think it would be on par with Damnation if it was an instant. Which is in not In terms played. of power level. <laughs> oh my god. Alright, alright, alright. All right. Moving on. <laughs> we, we, we... What else <laughs> have we got to talk right. about? <laughs> I don't like Vati's Last Reckoning, but I can be oh. convinced otherwise. <laughs> Maybe when we see the format, <laughs> it will be actually good or something, but as of right now, I just don't see how it's worth it. I think Anger is still, like, the best removal. But there is no Anger. You mean Sweltering Suns? No, 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 I meant modern. I still, even at instant, I still think anger would be better. All right, we're totally off topic. All right, so that is is it for the Hour of Devastation cards. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Arch Enemy. We have all the the schemes, so some really interesting schemes. Uh, Again, to just kind of recap on Arch Enemy, it's been a while. Um, It's a multiplayer format where... A team of three players uh, is playing against this kind of final boss in the arch enemy, and you get schemes every turn. Uh, you start at 40 life. You'll be using, the in this instance, in the Cold Bolas uh, deck with the schemes. Uh, each turn you get a scheme. Uh, some of them are, you know, one-time effects. Some of them are ongoing. Uh, they changed it up a little bit in, in this time around. Um, so... It's three individual players, and last time it was based definitely three individual players. This time around, they're kind of making the three players more of a team where you can block for each other. Um, that's basically all they did. You can kind of block for each other so not one person is left defenseless. Um, and they brought back uh, Nicole Boas as a reprint, the original Nicole Boas, Planeswalker. They brought back, back uh, Nissa World Waker, Chandra Pyromaster, and Gideon Jura, all with new art. And they will all be foil, I believe. I'm not certain about that. But uh, it's an interesting format. I think the MSRP, Richard, you looked it up, was $59.99? Yep, $60. 60 bucks. And again, it's it's a great multiplayer format, uh, but we were kind of going through just more of a, um outside of the multiplayer. Are you getting the value? Uh, a brief... <laughs> 
look through, Seth and I quickly determined, uh, probably not. Uh, but again, it, it's really fun. It is actually pretty difficult. I played the original Arch Enemy. Uh, it's pretty difficult to win. Um, as who? The, the schemes? The, the Arch Enemy or the... No, the as the three, as the three players. The, the, the schemes, like if you chain a couple of decent schemes together, especially the ongoing schemes, it, it, it could get out of hand pretty quickly. Uh, it's, I, I believe like some of the original schemes, like one was like an ongoing, it was like an abyss. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll read some schemes so people know. So basically, yeah. to help you in your 1v3 battle, you're getting to play a free card every turn, and these cards are schemes, and they do different things. So for example, a reckoning approaches. When you set this scheme in motion, look at the top six cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield, put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So a free Aetherworks Marvel Spin. Uh, another scheme, when you set the scheme in motion, you gain control of target creature and opponent controls and untaps it. So these schemes actually do quite powerful things and they're supposed to, you know, even out the battle because it is 3v1. I, I don't think this product is for me. I'm not especially interested yep. in it, but I think that there's probably some value if you have four friends, you each throw down 15 bucks. It's probably a fun and somewhat repeatable experience because you can uh, take turns being the arch enemy and so forth. So I think it's probably fun and interesting in certain situations. But unless you actually plan on playing arch enemy with some of your friends, then you probably don't have a really big reason to buy arch enemy. Yeah, it definitely seems like they've toned down the schemes this time, uh, this time around. I, all I can remember was last time the schemes were really ridiculous. I can't remember all, some of them off the top of my head, but uh, it definitely seems like they scaled back, at, at least the ongoing schemes. Uh, but they still are pretty powerful, and um, it is a lot of fun. But yeah, at the end of the day, I, I don't think me personally, like Seth, is just going to go out and buy this. But if there was interest, if some, if you know, you know, a few friends, or you know, at your local gaming store where you know that there's like going to be people that will like to play this on a normal basis, then maybe you all chip in and, and grab it, or you know, the shop has it, you know, to play randomly. Yeah, you can get it on um, eBay for forty seven dollars. So okay. you know, unlike so that's, that's other products better. where the price is like double the MSRP, <laughs> this one sells for <laughs> they're looking to get rid of it already less. So. <laughs> Forty-seven dollars is like you know eleven, twelve bucks per person if you, you want to go in with the group. Uh, but the schemes have a new frame, so I want your guys' opinion on these frames versus the masterpiece frames. So the frames to describe them, I don't know. They look full art. There's like a text box, and then there's bolus horns going up to create the frame between the the rules text and then the title of the card. Love it. I mean, this might actually, I mean, I don't, maybe they won't do this, but this could, I could see this being like the Hour of Devastation frame. Like they just used the frame both times. Because this is all about Amon Ket. Um, it's all about Bolas. Maybe they use something similar, but this is definitely more, just a lot cleaner than having all this crazy stuff going on. Like uh, at the end of the day, I ended up liking I kind of like the invocations from the start, but this is just really clean. Uh, I like the fact that there's it just leaves more space for the art, and that's really what it's all about. Eh, I mean, I think it's fine. I do like having more art on the card, so I do like that aspect of it. The way it's designed, you get to see it is kind of like full art-ish, and even more so in some ways because it kind of goes all the way down to the bottom around where the rules text is and up above the name on the top. So it's kind of like ultra full art in some sense. So I think they look cool, but eh, I don't know. I think it, I think they're fine. Yeah, I like. I think I like the invocations better, but... These are pretty cool. I like the full art. I like I like how there's uh, something that's understated is, you know, you have 20 new schemes. You actually have 20 new pieces of Magic the Gathering lore art. Like, I don't know, you have like 15 Nicol Bolas pictures in here. <laughs> and then you have like a whole bunch of other pictures. So you actually get a lot of uh, new art for people that care about that. And the frame looks cool. It's interesting. They don't look like Magic cards. The frame makes them really look weird, but uh, I like them. And it, it gives a different look for the schemes, which is good. Worth noting, they're also not the size of magic. Oh, cards, wait, what? Yeah. They're not the size of magic. Yeah, they're, cards. Like, 
No, no, they're no. Like they're weird oversized cards, sort they're, of. They're they're yeah. they're about the same as the oversized cards that used to come in the uh, commander products. They're almost that. Why big. would you do so this? You can't just put it. <laughs> Why into do that? they need yeah. to be bigger? <laughs> Wait, uh, what's on the card I, back? I don't know. Um, now, um, normally it was it was not even a Magic the Gathering card back. It was like uh, like Arch Enemy, and it was like this this weird like. Um, it was like kind of like a magic card, but not really. It just said like arch enemy in the middle. It didn't have the like the general like five colors. It was just oh, like arch enemy. But uh, I, hate, like I mean, I don't mind about the card back, but the fact that you can't put them in sleeves. No. Like, yeah, nope. you definitely can't. Oh, oh, what did they? No, why would they do this? One more question for you about these cards. So one of the, I guess, cool parts of it is we have four planeswalkers, all with new art. So I think yep. the cool Bolas art is. Super good. Like, I, I think it's it. super awesome. What do you think about the other Planeswalkers? I'm a little lukewarm on, like, the Gideons and Chandras and so forth. What do you think of the new art on those? How's it compared to the original? Yeah, Chris Ron is awesome. But, so, I, I maybe this is just m- me in terms of where we saw Nissa World Waker, like, kind of first. It's just weird to see, like, Nissa World Waker that was, like, kind of Zendikar-themed, very Zendikar-themed. Like, just randomly on Amon Ket, it's just this, like, kind of just generic pose. I don't know. It's like, you got used to seeing with the 4-4 elementals, and, you know, it was... I don't know. I just... I'm kind of lukewarm on them, too, Seth. They're just kind of very generic poses. They're not generic, right? They, they're they all looking upwards, and Nicol Bolas is towering above them. Sure. But you would never know this is on Amon Ket. Like, just from these well, arts. Like, like, you would horns never know like, that. Like, background. <laughs> In fact, it's like two mm. Amonkhet for no reason, right? Uh, I don't know. I, I I like the Chandra. I don't like the Nissa. I definitely don't like the Gideon. Uh, the, I like the, the Nissa. Obviously, is good. The and part. if they're foil, the Chandra is gonna look pretty sweet. I think because all those flames. I really hope they are foil. If they're not, that would be a bummer. But I wouldn't play. I wouldn't play this new Gideon. He looks weird. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, yeah he looks like he's sixty years old or something in that picture. I think. <laughs> It's like old. It looks man like Gideon. he's like Def- pulling a kite or something along. <laughs> like it's like a like what, like a sparkler, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it looks like he's running with fireworks. I don't know. I don't really like this Gideon. I think it's my favorite Nicole Bolas art though. If I was gonna get a commander deck when play Nicole Bolas Planeswalker, which I would, because Nicole Bolas is sweet in in Commander. I think yeah. I would go with this one. This I kind of wish that was choice. the God Pharaoh art. To be honest with you, ooh, yeah, I didn't even think. I of really kind of wish that was the God Pharaoh art. I'm not actually kind of really disappointed now. I like the horns going up over the words. It's yeah. pretty sweet. Very Nicole Bolasi. All right. June 16th, 11 days from now, Arch Enemy, $59.99. You can get them on eBay for like 47 And I suspect they'll go down further because these are pre-order prices and they're starting <laughs> this low. Uh, so, yeah. so I think the money cards, uh, Gideon, Chandra, oh, Sh- not really Chandra. Chandra's like two bucks. Gideon, Nissa, uh, Nicol Bolas, and then... You have some like random cards thrown in there: Sun Titan, Grand Abolisher, Grim Lava Mancer, uh, sort of the Animus. So it, it gets slim pretty quick. So you're you're really I, buying it for call, the schemes. Yeah. Like you really need to enjoy and the walkers enjoy the product. Otherwise, just buy singles. Yeah, there's a bunch of I'm gonna call them. I'm gonna start calling these cards the supplemental car- product cards. Like they really are a recurring like the. Harvester of Souls, I think, might be like in every single supplemental product in existence. It's the green Sphinx card. Of, <laughs> Sphinx of Jwar Isle, like you just get your gen- generic supplemental. It's cards. like a, there's like a sticker of uh, Arch Enemy <laughs> set symbol over <laughs> the previous set symbol. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, do do it's almost like they have a list rares. of like... Just, just put a sticker on uh, them and stick them in. <laughs> I literally enemy. think they printed out a list. They're like, all right, we have another supplemental product. What can we put in this time? Oh, there's a, a Sphinx of Jwar Isle. We'll just put that right in there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's meant for new players. And the cards they gear towards new players are always the same cards. <laughs> yeah. I really like the Chandra list, actually. It has some pretty decent stuff in it. It has, like, Inferno Titan, Avatar of Fury. That's a throwback right there. You get some Mythics. And you get a you get a Torchling. You get a Grim Lava Mancer, Dual Caster Mage. You get some decent stuff in there. Oh, remember when that card was so expensive oh, and Oh, my goodness, I remember this card. And now it's 78 cents. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Crazy. Oh, good it is a in Commander with Dual Caster Mage. Yeah, just uh, there's like a million printings of it now, apparently. 
All right, time for fish mail. If you have yes. your questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish on Twitter, do the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. First question from BM Sullivan. What do you feel the Saffron Olive effect says about the volatility and size of the Magic Online market? Thousand percent spikes. Uh, well, I mean, it's partly because a lot of the cards are really cheap to begin with. You can't really have a ten dollar card spike a thousand percent, but you can have a two cent card go up to a dollar or something, and it looks crazy in percentage terms. But it's definitely true that Magic Online is much more up and down than the paper market is, mostly because it's so easy to buy and sell cards. You can do it in seconds instead of days. You just click a button and you own the cards now, and then click a button and you sell the cards when you have shipping and all that in the paper world. Yeah, and it's just supply and demand, right? The cards will spike and then come back down pretty quickly as people stock them. Because if you run a bot, say you run like 12, you, you, you own 12 of a card, that's only three play sets. So if three people want to play this deck then you just quote unquote bought out a particular you know bot uh you know particular account right so if you have 50 people or 100 people or a thousand people trying to buy this deck there just simply aren't enough cards so the price goes up and then as they restock these cards because you're looking at your your draft leftovers you're like hey i have all these cards people sell them back to the bots then the price comes back down it's it's pretty regular when you look at it also worth noting that a lot of it is automated as well. So if a bot sells a playset or two playsets of a card, it just automatically increases X percent on the price. So unlike paper where you have someone physically pricing the cards as they're sold, this kind of just does it all by itself. The bot does all that automatedly. So it makes it super easy for a price to increase really quick. If you have 30 people all buy a playset, the price will just automatically increase as more and more playsets are sold. Okay, next question. Kyle O'Meters, what do you guys think about guns in Magic the Gathering? Uh, there are a few cards with well, guns. I, I remember I actually saw a are, list, they, like yeah. actual guns, not like cannons, but like actual guns. But there, there's just like a handful of cards that depict guns. No, there's like cannons and like yeah, yeah no, I mean, but I, I mean like, like actual like bus. what you would think as a a gun, not like fire, you know, not not cannons and stuff because there are a lot of cannons and stuff in Magic. Cannons and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it kind of almost felt like there was some stuff back like. In the Weatherlight saga, because there was all that, like, aerial combat, and then there was, like, yeah. But So what do you think about guns in Hour of Devastation? Maybe not Hour of Devastation. They had the to keep set. it, like, you know, blunderbuss kind of, you know, swashbuckler type thing. Then I think it's still cool, but, it, it, I mean, if people are rolling around with, like, you know, an M16, <laughs> like, that's, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're saying, like, uh, guns that you would find in the 1600s or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just don't think, like, if we're getting to that realm where, like, you're looking at modern day, you know, guns and weaponry, like, that's not. But So you're telling me a a skyship, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a city floating in things, Heart of Kiran's, is doable but not guns? That's what I'm saying. Oh, I, I think they should have put guns <laughs> on Kaladesh. That would have been the perfect place. It's, it's that, like an ether well, gun. Didn't they kind of have that? It's like a rail gun or they something. Like the, to shoot yeah, either. they kind of have like plasma cannons or, you know, I, I, they kind of had like similar stuff, right? Yeah. I think I think it's okay if they're fantasy guns, but I don't think you want realistic guns. I don't think that would be fun. What do you think about gun equipment? Like, could you have just, like, swords or equipment? Could you have, I don't know. Oh, please, give me <laughs> Gun of War and Peace. <laughs> what would it do? <laughs> uh, what about, like, Wild West? Is Wild West fantasy enough? If you had, like, a Wild West plane? Uh, like, just revolvers? Yeah, revolvers or something. Like, Westworld. Go, like, Final Fantasy style, like, Gunblade. Gun Blade. You know? <laughs> It'd be even more ridiculous. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think they could do something with guns. So I, you know, I don't want, I don't want to see like Counter Strike, <laughs> you know, the Counter Strike playing the but... <laughs> Yeah, I think steampunk and stuff like that, you could like fit guns in, or you know, kind of futuristic planes. Sure. Do you think it's just like a cultural thing now where guns are too controversial? Like you know how we used to have more like 
I don't know, I guess, occultish references in, in the old art. And then mm. people got mad and freaked out and they kind of toned down uh, some of that stuff. Do you think that guns is on their list of things that they are I, afraid people will freak out if they put on cards? So they I don't think do? so. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's a really good point because they kind of toned back. Not that, you know, people really were right, but there were some, like, really obvious ties to, like, demonic and, like, satanic kind of things back then. I mean, you had, what was that card? Um, the uh, Something Horde? And you had, like, demonic pentag- Horde? Yeah, demonic <laughs> Horde and, like, pent- Pentagram of whatever. And you had, like, Preacher. You had some, like, really <laughs> obvious, like, demonic and satanic tropes. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, th- I think they they're, they don't make guns because they don't want to break the immersion from fantasy as opposed to right kind of you know the, the social political aspect of guns and you know what what they mean so i i would imagine it's more of the guns don't belong with dwarves like argument right or they actually do belong with dwarves but we'll just ignore that for a second they do <laughs> that was a bad example <laughs> my bad uh all right with like elves we'll use elves yeah yeah like i don't need a bow just give me a gun <laughs> <laughs> next right. question from at hayati munro what do you think of kalia of the vast in moto 1v1 commander kalia of the vast in moto 1v1 it just doesn't work it's not it's really not as potent in in 1v1 commander mainly just because kalia is so fragile and you know in multiplayer edh you can get away with it but when folks are playing like into the Royal and, uh, you know, lightning bolt and, you know, really specific, I guess, you know, one versus one cards. It's just Kalia is just not as appealing. I think you'd have to find some way to combo with it. Like if you'd find a way where you get in one attack and you win the game by what you put in your hand, maybe you could find a way to do it. But I think generally speaking, what Chaz said is very true. Also, it kind of incentivizes you to play all this big overcosted yep. stuff and if once you play 1v1 commander you'll realize mana curves are actually vintage legacy esque like there's a lot of decks that you don't really get much above like four or five mana it's pretty low to the ground and fast and competitive in that sense so i think it's a tough sell for competitive commander yep. all right next question from shady shade of hades what about non-cantrip brainstorm Blue, instant, draw three, put back three. Super Wait. broken. Oh, so I you, see. So, so you draw Super three, broken, put so. back three, so you net nothing. <laughs> okay. And I would right. be playing four of in modern. <laughs> it's definitely still a four of. You still have fetch lands. Yeah, you so have fetch lands, like so three. you can put back your dead cards, <laughs> right? Or you can... <laughs> yeah. You, you, can draw, you can draw useless cards. Like, people play Cathartic Reunion and stuff like that, right? So mm-hmm. I, 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 could, I could see this being played. And if you, oh, yeah, you know, draw three, put away your dead cards, shuffle, then you basically ancestral vision slash recall. Too good. Yeah, it's still. I too bet good. it would be fine for standard or even bad in standard. But yeah. I think you're right about modern and legacy. Bad, yeah, definitely not as good as standard. But well, for probably not legacy. We have evolving have so wilds. Real trips, we have but... evolving wilds. We can do it. <laughs> I. I... <laughs> I think that's fine. <laughs> if you, you want to play Mono Blue Evolving Wild so you can shuffle away after your <laughs> your one mana card, that, I think that's okay. Yeah. All right, next question from Xenos Fan 2. What is the likelihood of a free sack slash payout win con? Example, Goblin Bombardment in Modern. Uh, Don't we have this? I feel like we have something like we, that. There, there are sort of uh, Blasting Station is yeah, the closest, Yeah, Blasting I Station... Think. Uh, but that has some conditions on it that makes it not real Goblin Bombardment. I think Wizards has shown that, that they're not interested in printing that yeah, type of free, outlet. Because we've sack. seen cards similar yep. to Goblin Bombardment, but they always have like a one mana cost now to activate it. So I think that that's just the new normal and what Wizards is going to do from here on forward. Yeah, I can't remember when they a- actually said, like confirmed that they don't like doing it. And then they printed Nintuko Husk in origins i don't know which came first but they're definitely getting away from like the free sack outlets i think free sack outlets that don't win you the game are somewhat okay in some situations but i think that they're worried about the kind of combo of something that deals damage i think they're worried about the combo potential without having added cost 
Next question, FD territory. How do you tell the difference between this is a good deck and I'm top decking well? I mean, just the consistency. Yeah, I mean, play more games because it, it it'll if you're top decking well, sooner or later you'll kind of regress to the mean and you'll find out what the deck's really like. So I think, I mean, it's an interesting challenge though when you're working in small sample sizes. Your deck is, if you're doing well, it, your deck probably isn't as good as it seems. And if you're doing really poorly, your deck's probably not as bad as it seems. All right, next question from JK Donati. Quiz time. What are the top five most expensive non-reserve list cards in paper? Oh, oh God. <laughs> top five non-reserve list? It's gotta be like... No, um, there's like... Okay, uh... I think I know this. I know I know at least a few of them. All right, just throw some out. They might actually all five of them be in Portal 3K. The what's the time walk one? Something Temporal of Zin Zhao. What? Oh, 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 oh. I was That's thinking, like 350 okay, bucks. Uh I don't think that's on the reserve list. I think there's there's ones from very early sets too that you don't think of like is it bizarre? Is bizarre not on the reserve list? There's a, one of those candelabra Candelabra no, probably is. There's like it definitely is. there's some random ones that haven't been reprinted that are really yeah, expensive. It's not bizarre. I think Workshop? It's... Is it Mishra's Workshop? I don't remember. No, that one's on there. Uh it you're right though. You are right. I just can't remember which one it is. Uh oh, Did they provide us the answers? Nope. <laughs> yeah. <No>. Oh <laughs> that's for your research. <laughs> so I don't even know if I'm right. Uh I know one th- there's a lot of Portal 3K cards that are just a lot of, that cost a lot of money just because they never were reprinted. And it's Portal 3K. Like, the Imperial Seal is still a lot. Uh, the something of Jin Zhao. I can't remember that card, but it's like five mana take an extra turn or something like that. Got nothing for you. How about random promos? Do they <laughs> count? <laughs> Do random promos count? I mean, they're not reserve they're not list, list. So I, I don't know. Judge promo, uh, uh, force of will, or like that that one of card yeah. that Miro gave to his wife when they proposed. That yeah. one. There's the dragon or whatever, the Japanese dragon card. The chi- The chi- yeah. The Chinese zodiac yeah. dragon. Zodiac Dragon. All right. Uh, we don't have an answer, but it'd be yeah. cool if we actually came up with this. I'm actually <laughs> curious now. We're we going to have to dig for this one. Uh, also from JK Donati, it seems like the most expensive Almond Cat cards aren't seeing competitive play. It is price driven by casual players. Are we talking about Gideon of the Trials? What, what are these most expensive cards? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming it's like Gideon of the Trials. And I, I mean, Gideon... And is- as foretold... <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, they have seen fringe play, and yeah. people are still playing them a little bit. So I don't think they're just purely casual cards. Maybe, I mean, you probably have a better argument there for something like Anointed Procession, which actually has been seeing competitive play too, I guess. But that seems like a card that could be yeah. supported by the casual market. But they're not that expensive, like $13, $12 for a Mythic that sees some amount of play doesn't seem absurd to me or like it's being propped up that much by the yeah and it's not just akh i mean this is just a a trend we've seen since they've included masterpieces i mean prices start out high and then truthfully there's maybe one card over 20 bucks in a standard set at one time if that yeah. yeah if that and uh it's mostly just because it is a good card and it will likely see play. It's just not seeing play right now, which doesn't mean it's a bad card. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, Chandra Torch of Defiant, Torch of Defiance, still over twenty bucks. I think somewhere around there, very maybe just barely over. But it's still, it's just still a good card, and uh, people recognize that. It's just not good right now, and it has its uses, just like uh, getting into the trials. And um, you know, you look at stuff like I me. Mean, EMA didn't have uh, masterpiece, so never mind. But yeah, just masterpiece sets. Is, it's it's a trend we continue to, and we're going to continue to see. All right, next question from G San San Shi Golo. Uh, do you think the Bolas Walker is the last draw for Marvel? We kind of answered this, but we don't think yeah we Bolas will even this. be played as long as Ugin and Chandra are around. But post rotation, who knows? Also from J K Donati, three fish mail in one week. What's up with this? Record. New Who record. from the crew New record, is going think, to yeah. Vegas, and how can we meet up with you guys? I am, I am not, not going, going to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, Chaz, I am going? not going. Either. Okay, I was, I was, I was planning on trying to go, but it's just not. So gonna nobody work is out, so. going. Hence, you cannot meet up with us. 
Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, we will try to make that a thing at, at one point. Um, All right, next question from Woodblade. Can you explain how Wizard makes money on Magic Online with bots? No real need to purchase anything from them. Not even ticks. Uh, well, everything comes from wizards at one point or another. So that's that's part of the answer. If there's a tick you're getting from a bot, it's, uh, a bot at some point someone got that from the wizard store because that's the only way they enter the system. The other one is they they basically take a rake out of every competitive match you play. So if you play a two-player queue, you combined people put in four dollars and combined they get out three fifty. So you have thousands of matches like that being played every day so it's uh, that money's being pulled out of the system which again is causing someone somewhere to have to buy ticks to get them back in the system so slowly that money is being removed league by league match by match whenever and whenever anyone plays competitive games of limited or constructed yeah and they get you on the sign up too 10 bucks oh, i still can't believe they <laughs> ridiculous charge you 10 dollars <laughs> they oh, should at so least bad, give yeah. you a dual deck or something a planeswalker deck Instead of just, like, random cards. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta do very short rant here since we're on the topic. I ran into someone recording this week who was in the modern queues and obviously had just gotten an account and built a deck that had, like, ice over and just, like, the new player cards. They give you 800 random commons when you sign up and you get, like, five tickets. That's, like, two matches worth. And they're playing in the modern queues and there's no tutorial to send these people in the right place. Like, if you play another game for the first time, Hearthstone walks you right through, like, what to do, how to get into, you know, you play against the computer, against the the um, AI or whatever. So Wizards needs to do something like that, because I'm sure that that person, and I ended up scooping to them because I felt bad and didn't want to take their, their ticks, but I'm sure there's people that pay 10 bucks jump into the wrong queue because there's no one showing them where to go, no tutorial, lose all their money, and just quit Magic forever. So, I don't know. I'm very frustrated by that right now. Wizards really like needs I, to step up that game. Yeah, I feel like we brought this up at one point, and I, I believe, not like to, to rehash old things, but it was, I think I, we brought that up at one point, and um, in not so many words, we were like, oh, it's not that bad, you know, people kind of figure it out, uh, but I have to tell you, if I didn't have you to kind of walk me through MTGO when I signed up, Seth, like, I would have no idea what the hell to do. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty standard. Like, if you know exactly how to play Magic and what's involved in Magic, and you sign up for MTGO, you still don't know what's going on. <laughs> now, imagine <laughs> if you knew nothing about Magic and you signed up, right? Like, it's they're not tailoring yeah. for new players. Yeah. They're not tailoring to make the experience good. Uh, yep. So, I mean, even by definition, if you look at their slides, Magic I, Online is for the advanced, you know, invested player or whatever, right? Duels is supposed to be the I, I know that platform, episode. but I, you know, I disagree with that strategy, but that is their strategy, right? You no, know, I, had, I had a few people who, are in a, in a close friend of mine who's, you know, got on MTGO and they just really couldn't understand like phantom drafting and, you know, tried to explain it. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, well, why am I still pretty much have to pay for this? Like, it's it just still, it, it's even when you explain it, it still doesn't make sense. So, I mean, I think at the very least you have to have like a, a t- tutorial you know, set up to send people in the right direction and just so they're not bleeding tickets quickly and then suddenly they don't have anything and they just don't want to do it anymore. Yep, 10 bucks should get you a dual deck or Planeswalker deck and you should be able to play yeah. Unlimited against other people that also have these decks. Just like uh, yeah. just like Pokemon. All right. Yep, you're exactly uh, right. Last question. Random Dark Rider, what cards do you love to play but aren't really competitive? Oh... Um, there's a, there's a lot for me. There's so many, <laughs> yeah. watch, watch against uh. the odds and you'll get a pretty good <laughs> sense, but, uh, uh. Maybe I'm going to say Videlkin Shackles. I really like that card. I've been able to occasionally play it in modern, but right now it's just not good enough, but I really enjoy that card for some reason. I don't know why. I want Death Cloud to be good again. Like mm. I loved that deck, Black Green Death Cloud. I have a lot of modern cards that are somewhat decent, but never see play that I always try to make work. Ashiok, uh, swords, any sword. I like Sword of Light and Shadow. Ooh, Ashiok. Cool no. ultimatum. Just like cards that are good. <laughs> <laughs> you can never play them or yeah. make them work, but they're not like totally janky. They're not totally out there. 
I want Troll Ascetic to be good again, but they just pretty much made a better version in Thrun. <laughs> and both of them are, like, not even good anymore, which is crazy. If Blue ever gets good in Modern again, Thrun will probably have a home. Yeah, Blue, Blue is totally. the top deck. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, like, it can Troll be counter spell Blue, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what great cards. All right, that's all our fish meal for this week. Thank you for everyone who sent them in. Awesome. So, yeah, that's going to wrap it up for us uh, this episode. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, uh, join us again next week. Uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about uh, for the next few weeks. So join us then, and we will see you next time. This is the Goldfish Crew signing out. <laughs>